If you've been following along on our journey through How to Read a Book, The Classic Guide to Intelligent Reading by Mortimer J. Adler and Charles Van Doren, then you know we finished part two, stage two of reading, inspectional reading. The authors seem to agree with me that after that, we need a palate cleanser and some encouragement. They offer that in the chapter we're going to discuss today. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Maxey, also known as Library Lynn. Today we're going to cover Chapter 5 in How to Read a Book. If you'd like to see the rest of the videos in the series, they're in the playlist below. As I mentioned earlier, the last chapter we covered was called The Second Level of Reading, Inspectional Reading. There are a lot of steps you have to go through to accomplish that stage. And I've got to admit, it made my head hurt. I felt like I was swimming in soup while I was reading that chapter. But as I said in the first video in this series, I'm determined to follow their advice. So I've been following their suggestions for the inspectional reading in the books that I've read since. And you know what? I've actually found that the process is helpful and once you get used to it, it really isn't all that time consuming. But I have to admit the last part of that stage is skimming the book and I haven't been doing that because the books I'm reading are not that difficult and I don't need to really incorporate the knowledge. I just need to get a feel for it. So I haven't been doing that part, but I did do the first part that had the most steps. And I have to say, it really has helped me a little bit with my reading comprehension in the books that I've been looking at. And when I pick up a truly difficult book, I'm going to give it a shot. They have suggestions for challenging books at the end, quite a few suggestions, and they really do look daunting. And I plan on following all these steps and reading at least one, maybe more of those books when I finish, and I'll discuss those when I get to that. Isn't it grand that life has so much to offer? But on to today's chapter, chapter five, how to be a demanding reader. After they remind us again that we must be active readers, and this time they refer to it as staying awake, which is pretty apt, I think, while reading, they actually seem a bit sympathetic to their readers who may be thinking that all this is a bit much to take, but they insist that you must learn the rules that they're going to teach if you wish to become a really good reader. I don't know why they didn't spell out these questions earlier, and maybe they did and I missed it, but they outline four questions that every reader must ask and answer before a book that is difficult for them can be understood. If you can't answer these questions, they say you won't understand the book. So here are the questions. Number one, what is the book about as a whole? Number two, what is being said in detail and how? Number three, is the book true in whole or in part? And number four, what of it? Okay, now that you have those questions, go for it. Just answer them for every book you read and the entire world of knowledge will be yours. <laughs> My eyes crossed after reading the first question. What's it saying in detail? I have ADHD. How can I concentrate long enough to determine that? Is it true? That sounds like it will require both thought and research. And what of it? What do they even mean by that? Okay, let's calm down and see what they have to say. If you watch the video on inspectional reading, you realize that inspectional reading will answer question one. As I mentioned, I've been doing this and so far it works. It helps with comprehension. It almost seems like magic. Inspectional reading answers the question that helps you grasp the structure of the book, which is important. Question two answers, what is being said in detail and how? They say that here you're looking for the main ideas, assertions, and arguments that the author is making to make a case for their message. They say if you skim the book, you should be able to do a pretty good job of answering this question. So that's the part that I haven't been doing is the skimming. And both these questions can be answered by doing an inspectional reading. So great, we're halfway there already. Once you've answered these two questions, you can move on to question three. Is the book true? in whole or in part. You have to make up your own mind about this, they say. You know what the author thinks and you must decide whether or not you agree. I'm sure they'll delve more into how to do that later. Question four asks, what of it? Okay, by this they mean, does it matter? What's the significance? Is it important or not? And does it matter to you personally? 
should it matter to anybody else at all? It's these last two questions that stage three analytical reading will help us answer, and we'll start covering analytical reading in the next video. So that's an overview of the most important questions to answer about a book you're reading. Now they switch gears and move on to a subheading called how to make a book your own. They're not talking about borrowed books here. If a book you're reading belongs to a friend or a library, do not follow these suggestions. But they seem to think that if the book is worth taking the trouble to read thoroughly, you should buy your own copy. And if you're if you do, then you're free to follow these suggestions. Okay, here's what they say about that. When you buy a book, you establish a property right to it, just as you do in clothes or furniture when you buy or pay for them. But the act of purchase is actually only the prelude to possession in the case of a book. Full ownership of a book comes only when you make it part of yourself. And the best way to make it part of yourself, which comes to the same thing, is by writing in it. So, okay, the first step here is read with a pencil in your hand. That's right. They want you to mark up your book. Now, I know this is controversial and some sensitive book lovers may faint at the very idea, but this in fact is what they suggest. Maybe it would be better to start with a cheap paperback copy. If you've got a book like, say, The Divine Comedy, and you want to buy a nice book, a hardback book, in a good edition that you'd like to keep, fine. Buy yourself a cheap paperback copy as well. Okay, now once you've got your copy of your book that, and you've gotten adjusted to the idea of writing in it, here's where the fun begins. Writing in the book, they say, will keep your thoughts active and your mind awake. Here are the devices they suggest. Number one, underline the major points and forceful statements or quotes you'd like to note. Vertical lines at the margin to emphasize what you've underlined or for passages too long to underline. Stars, asterisks, or this is what they say, doodads, only use sparingly to mark the most important parts of the book. Generally, less than a dozen of these per book should be used, and I always overuse them, apparently. Numbers in the margin for points the author makes in developing an argument. Numbers of other pages in the margin, and they say you can use CF, which means compare to. This points you to other pages that discuss or are relevant to the discussion at hand. Circle keywords and phrases. And writing in the margin at the top or bottom of a page. You do this to record questions that you have, to simplify complicated statements, or to record major points in the book. And then once you've done all that, they suggest you take the end papers at the front of the book and the back of the book and write on those as well. The end papers at the back of the book, they say, make a personal index of the author's points in order of appearance. So you can do that as you read along. Or end papers at the front. After you complete the personal index, you've worked your way through the entire book, go back and outline the entire book using your own understanding and words of what the book says. The next subheading and the last subheading in this chapter is forming the habit of reading. Now they get into their pep talk. They say they realize that all this sounds daunting and we haven't even gotten to anal analytical reading yet. And they're correct in this. It does sound daunting. But here's the thing. They say if you learn to do this and practice it, they promise that it will not only become easier, it will actually become a part of you and your ability to understand what you read will go up astronomically, and it becomes easier and easier as time goes on. And they compare it to skiing. They say to start with, it's very hard for an adult who's been walking for decades to learn to ski. There's lots of rules you have to follow to be able to do it even badly. Someone who learned to do it young can do these things without even thinking about them because to them it's second nature. They also compare reading like this to artists, Great artists, say, they say, become great because they break the rules. But to break the rules well, they have to know, understand, and follow the rules. And there are some rules they can never break, like rules for mixing paint. If they don't follow those rules, they can't break rules further on and create something original. It's the same thing with reading, they say. If you take the time and make the effort to follow these rules, your ability to read for comprehension will soar 
and a whole new intellectual world will open up for you. I don't know about you, but this pep talk actually worked for me, and I'm eager to get started to learn to read analytically. I had to admit I was really kind of dreading it before. As I said before, we will begin covering analytical reading in the next video in this series, part two, the third level of reading, analytical reading, in which we will begin with chapter six, pigeonholing a book. So that's it for this time. For excellent nonfiction books to read, check out my books in the description box below. Like, subscribe, and share if you like this video. And until next time, happy reading.